been reading the book called Free Take Brothers recently. Seen that book? Yeah. See? Yes, I have read it. It's pretty good. What do y'all think about that? I liked it. Can I have a discussion with it? I actually have some questions right here about it that I was going to teach at Oxford. <laughs> That's crazy, man. Get some beverages before we start. How about that? Thank you, kind sir. Can I take your order? <laughs> <laughs> Cookies, please. I'm sorry. I'm good. I'm good. Cheers. I'll be right back. Okay, so let's talk about the screw tape letters. Would you like to start? Sure. So, if y'all could just describe the book just a little bit, like a summary of what the book is, what your interpretation of the book was, what would you say, like in a summary? So, I really liked it, first of all. It had a real deep meaning that I didn't really think about. There, so, both demons, geez, I don't even know where I'm going with this. So, the uncle is teaching his nephew how to be a good demon. There's no such thing, by the way. And he's trying to teach him how to make a Christian man turn bad. And he's the whole book is about him tempting the man to turn towards hell and away from heaven. And in the end, he fails because the man goes to heaven just because God always wins. Yeah, um, I like what he said. I think it's um, it's the story of um, an uncle teaching his nephew about the ways of being a demon and how to be better and how to influence um, what they call their patients um, on how to influence them and bring them to their father below who is Satan in hell. Yeah, just agreeing with you all about the uncle and nephew relationship, just trying to teach him the weaknesses of a Christian on earth and how to attack those weaknesses. And because um, every time, as it says in the book, every time a human goes to hell, that's their food. And they want to feast on that. So just they teaching him the advantages of um, turning in, um, demons to go to hell. Yeah. So a question that I would ask y'all is, how does the screw tape letters affect your view on spiritual warfare? So, like I said, it has really opened my eyes to things I haven't even thought about. It... The point of demons, they're trying to confuse you, and because of that confusion, we're also kind of, we don't realize that we're being tempted whatsoever, even though we might be a, a Christian. And they come right at you, and you don't even see it coming most of the time. They try to convince you that doing certain bad things is good. So the more you even learn about Christianity, the more they try to confuse you and make doctrines seem differently inter interpreted by the person, I would say. Or try and steer you away, away from it completely. One thing I thought was interesting is pretty early on in the book, it... Um, Screw, Uncle Screwtape said, we 
operate on two fronts. One is um, with the humans not knowing about us, and one is with them knowing about us. And so they can, we can either make them um, willing but unknowing, like servants of us, or we can make them into magicians if they know about us. Obviously, that doesn't work with everyone. Um, so, on like, it definitely makes me think more about the world going on around me and how, or my spiritual life and how they are affecting me and everyone around me every day. Um, and I hope I can keep it in mind better so I can kind of arm myself against it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just say it makes you more aware, obviously, of every time you get a distract, a sinful distraction or thought, it's you immediately think about screw tape and wormwood or think of wormwood, especially how he's like working in you on your weaknesses like that's they're always trying to get at you in different situations so yeah i think that definitely every time something like that comes up i immediately think of that now becoming kind of paranoid about how there's always a fight within mm -hmm. yeah one thing that caught my eye was at the end of every chapter Screwtape says, your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. And I was wondering, why do you think he says that? I think, um, I'm sure their affection is very much different from ours. He kind of hints that in the end, um, close to the end, where he says, um, on the basis of whether or not I love you, I love you is something like, that I'm about to eat or something like that and so it's very much um, what they can get out of each other um, so I think he may like him and when I said love before it's it's not like love from God the love that we have it's um, I guess more of an affection like he calls it um, referring to him trying to get stuff out of him. I'm not 100% sure, but that's just my thoughts on it. Going back to what you said about how he loves him because he's going to eat him, do you think it's more of like a prideful love in a way? Like prideful as to, like, because he's his... Because he's like, trying to get everything for himself out of the relationship, I guess? Um, that's not the impression I got early on um, because he is counseling him. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really sure um, how exactly it plays into it. Um, how exactly his affection in that sense that he wants to like eat him, um, how that plays into his affection. Um, so I'm, I don't really know. Here's what I'm wondering. Maybe if it, it could be prideful if screw tape would get some of the patient to eat. Maybe. Maybe so, more selfish than prideful. Yeah, so like doing it out of self-ambition and stuff. Like, so I guess we won't really ever know because we don't know if he was going to get part of them, but it may have hinted that close to the end. I think it's definitely off of a selfish ambition because I think the relationship with the demons is that they cannot have, I don't think they really care for each other, like at all. I think that their goal is just to try, they, they're willing to do whatever to make themselves appear to Satan as a great deceiver. And they try to, I think, make the others look like bad demons and not successful and weak. So I think that um, it's definitely out of selfish ambition for sure. And I think at the beginning, Wormwood and Screwtape's letter or relationship together is 
it's it seems pretty good, but I think it changes towards the end. Um, how do y'all think it changes? There's some, cause I caught up on some little things in the text that um, each chapter ended on your affection and uncle with screw tape, but I think it was the last or the second to last chapter it said. Um, your affectionate and increasingly ravenous uncle screw tape. Mm -hmm. So I think that shows he's getting angry and he's at unease with Wormwood. So, um, are there other things that y'all caught on to about that? Yeah, I think kind of like you were saying, he's kind of ravenous and it shows kind of from the beginning to the end, it slowly gets kind of hostile in both ways. Because Worm, Wormwood reports screw tape to the secret police, and that <laughs> is not good for Wormwood because screw tape says, You'll definitely pay for this. And yet he still counsels him and stuff like that. But he sometimes gets really angry and at the beginning of every letter, it feels like um, Screw Tape is criticizing for criticizing Wormwood for everything he's doing, not saying, "This is what you're doing well. This is you're doing great." He always says, "You're doing it all wrong. This is what you should be doing," and I think that kind of points to the type of relationship it is. Yeah, and I think. Um... I think it definitely, I think that screw tape and maybe all demons in this case, like their first priority is their duty and that's to like serve Satan and try and get people into hell. But right below that is their selfishness and their, um, what they want to accomplish. And so, um, Going back to what you said about your increasingly uh, ravenous uncle, um, like he says at the beginning of that chapter, he says, um, my love for you and your love for me are as like two peas. I have always desired you as you, pitiful fool, desired me. The difference is that I'm the stronger. I think they will give you to me now, or a bit of you. Love you? Why, well, yes, as a dainty, as dainty a morsel as ever I grew fat on. So, and at the end, it talks about how they, um, how they're feasting on, like, the souls of the humans that have come into hell. And so, um, that's an interesting concept I've never thought of before, because it sounds like screw tape's gonna end up eating at least part of Wormwood. Um, so I think like, the fact that he may eat part of Wormwood, he may, um, that he'll eat the souls of the people that have come into hell, that was an interesting concept that I've never thought of. Um, and I'm curious what y'all think about that, or if you want to continue with the other. I think that another part of the text that kind of goes on with what you're saying, I think that um, screw tape in at the beginning of chapter 30 is losing, starting to lose a lot of hope in Wormwood because it starts off, I sometimes wonder whether you think you have been sent into the world for your own amusement. So he thinks he's, Wormwood's just messing around down there and not taking his work seriously. And he's kind of threatening him to make a move on a human because it says at the, at the bottom of Bring us back food or be food yourself. So it's kind of like if you don't turn this human um, away from God and um, bring him to hell so that we can feast on that and enjoy that, we are going to feast on you for your weakness of not being able to complete your task on earth. I think that's kind of what he's saying there. 
And that just shows such a radical difference between, like, what we know of God and, like, Satan is that, like, such atrocities would happen there. Like, if that happened on Earth, no one would ever, like, eat you for doing something wrong. But, like, they commit such atrocities in hell that would never be done here, and so much more would never be done in heaven. Um, and I think it's interesting because, like, Screwtape gets more aggravated and more frustrated with him as it goes on because he's losing his patient. Um, and I also thought it was interesting how they used the word patient to describe the people they were tempting. So, what do y'all think about that? So, a patient is someone who is supposed to be helped. And what I thought was interesting is, usually if you're a patient, you're choosing to be a patient. But, let's, let's say for a second that you're not choosing to be, and let's say you're someone who is medically insane, okay? And you have to be a patient. Well, if the demons are looking at you that way, they think, okay, he has no idea what our plan is. We have to convince him of it. And I think that's kind of the way they look at us. They look at us as insane and think they need to change our minds and show us the truth, which they think they're helping us with, but it doesn't even help them much. They have miserable lives, so. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's interesting because we never really get a picture in the book about their lives being miserable, but they have to be because their actions and everything, their mindset shows everything is evil, everything is hateful, and I think everything that they want for the humans just shows a glimpse of what they what goes on in hell following everything. So I think that from what happens from where they are carries on to um, their mindset and everything. Yeah, definitely. And going back to that passage, like their love is like he describes it like love you. Why, yes, as a dainty morsel um, that I would grow fat on. Like, so it's not love, like, I love hanging out with y'all. It's love, like, I, I don't really know how to describe it because it's, e like, evil love. It's not real love um, because it's, it's the destruction of someone else. Um, so I just think that's kind of crazy. Kind of going off of that, how do you think demons define love? I think, uh, like, probably just however they can exploit someone else, maybe. Um, how they can benefit, I guess it's more self-love than anything else, but how they can benefit from any situation, perhaps. I think that... They would describe it as doing prob because they definitely don't have a clear definition, but I think it would be doing something to someone to benefit yourself because that's what they think they're doing. They're trying to do something or imply stuff on their messengers like Wormwood or even humans, and they think that they're benefiting that would benefit themselves um, in front of Satan. So that I think that's what they, I guess what they would call love. So like, you know, like saying their love is just selfishness. Yeah, I agree. I'm curious. Oh, oh, thank man. you. Eagle and child got some amazing crumpets. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You go wish it. Can never be ego and child, man. Mm-mm. All right. 
I believe you were starting a question. Yeah. So, um, I thought it was, maybe it's more of a statement. I just think it's super interesting how uh, everything that in the book is flipped. It's opposite of what we normally think of. Um, like, we think of God as our father. Um, but they refer to God as the enemy, and they refer to our father as Satan, and they usually refer to him as our father below or our king. Um, so I just thought that was interesting how it's opposite of how we see it. Yeah. I think an observation is that they contradict themselves a lot. Um, talking about screw tape, especially because we get to see his point of view. Because on page 79, let me find it here real quick. So on page 79, Screw Tape says, No natural phenomenon is really in our favor. So that's saying, like, he knows that the odds are against him. And for everybody, and for all the demons, that they know that they're at fault. So, but on page 175, it talks about, um, sometimes I am almost in despair. All that disdains me is the conviction that our realism, our rejection of all silly nonsense and claptrap must win in the end. So he thinks, he says that he thinks they will definitely win out in the end. But we talked about in Bible class many times um, through the demons and angels section how I think, or at least I think that all of the demons and Satan knows they're going to lose in the end. Like deep down, I think they know, but they don't want to admit, they want to make themselves seem like and make themselves believe that they're going to come out and win. Like he's saying here, like they must win in the end. But really, deep down, I think they know that God, his power just will overrule them completely. So, yeah, it's just kind of contradictory there. Yeah, one thing after reading that, you see that kind of the imperfection of the demons like satan is the king of lies and so they try to follow him and they end up lying to themselves even they can't help it because they're demons it is their natural way at the moment and so they do all these bad things to people on earth but they do it to each other and themselves. So I think that first quote you read, I think you're right. They do think they're going to lose, but at the same time, they're lying to themselves, giving themselves false hope, and kind of, they have like a very small, they think they have like the smallest chance of winning, but they think it must happen. But at the same time, they know it won't. So, yeah. And back to what you said about uh, his like contradictions. He says, um, "The truth is that like I messed up in saying that the enemy loves humans." So before he had kind of mentioned that, but then he's taken it back. Um, and so that's just kind of one example of it that I think um, also came out at several other points in the book. Um, and what y'all were saying about. Um, them thinking the, the, um, that the demons think that they will win. I think it even says that several points throughout the book, um, that they think that they will win. Um, but you also mentioned that passage where they have every, um, like they're completely disabled. Every pleasure is um for god <laughs> um and really hurts their cause they have to twist everything every pleasure that god has given to 
harm us and to bring us, um, to try and bring us down, which is super encouraging um, to some extent, I think, because it's nice to know that it's, that everything that is good um, comes from God and that they have to twist it. They have to change everything in order to um, tempt us and to drive us away from God. And the good thing about that is, I remember there's that verse that says what they meant for evil, God meant for good. So good always wins out in the end, no matter how much you try to twist it. Yeah. I think one thing is that it's confusing how these demons can be. They have to just be miserable, but they have that, they have such a drive to keep just having torturing humans and they have a drive to making s humans sin so I, I don't know if there's really an answer but why would you think like they just have persistence and like we see it throughout the novel how they continue to work on the patient um, in good situations and in bad situations so why, I mean, where does that drive come from? Because I would think that if you're just miserable, you just wouldn't want to do, be so dedicated. But they are always just right there and on everything, so. I think it kind of goes back a little bit to their false hope. If they bring someone to hell, it kind of gives them a little more hope that they're powerful enough to beat God. They might actually have a chance and i think it's also they want more souls to feast on and that's like the only good thing in their life they feel like almost if that makes sense yeah i think they're like seeking that um they feed off of like fear um i think a couple times uncle screw tape says that like um while that fear makes us feel really good, it's not beneficial. Um, so I'm not sure, 100% sure if it was fear or not, um, but just how that they feed off of our negative emotions. Um, and another interesting um, thing I thought was how um, early on in the book he said that Uncle Screwtape said that, um, like, each person is individual, and their individuality is something that God gave them, and so, while we can exploit it to some extent, God-given attributes and abilities are generally something that does not help us as demons, um, so, um, so, like, like, I really like lasagna and crumpets. Um, and so, I think, like, certain things that God has each person like. Um, like, I like playing sports. I like playing instruments. So, um, each person has individual things that they like. And um, that's what make them who they are. So, Yeah, I like what you were saying there. Um, so you were saying the individual individuality and things that come from God usually aren't good for demons, which kind of reminded me that all the good things that we do come from God and demons don't want to feed off from God because they can't and so I think that's another reason why they feed off of our negativity, because that's the only thing they can do. They have nothing else to do, and they think that's the only thing that will help them, I guess. Yeah. I think, like, I just thought of a question that I want to ask y'all. Um... Since we're believers, we probably have some ideas and perspectives on the book. 
But what do you think an unbeliever reading this book, I, what do you think their impression would be about sin and then about the contradiction, which is God? Like, how do you think they would handle that? I think, uh, like, close to the end, it talks about how um, Wormwood's patient died and how like he immediately went into the light and was glorified with God. Um, and so it's like, just that paints a beautiful picture of us going to heaven and being with God. Um, as far as an unbeliever's view on it, that's an interesting thought. Um, because the demons paint God as the enemy, um, I do think that that would give them perhaps some inaccurate views um, throughout the book. I think it's probably better to read as a believer than an unbeliever because it gives you an idea of what you're going up against, whereas as an unbeliever, it does give you an idea of what's going on. But one, you don't have a foundation for it to go on, and two, you don't... Um, to it may paint an inaccurate picture of um, in your head of who God is. Yeah, a little bit like that. I feel like it doesn't even speak about God that much. You don't find much about him. You just find out he's the enemy and that he's also going after the patients. And so I do think it would be very hard for an unbeliever to read this um it is a very logical book you see all the you do see the logic of the demons it doesn't work out and i think most people can see that but also they're i feel like the ways they're trying to tempt people in ways it's hard for unbelievers to see that as sin because it might be things that they do daily, and then in real life, a demon might say, no, this this book isn't true. We're not trying to tempt you like that, even though they are. So I think since it's just such common sin in the book, they don't want to think about themselves as being that bad. Yeah. I'm just going to read this one little section that I really liked, um, because a lot of times I'm not thankful for, like, the time I have, um, and each moment as I should be. Um, it says, the man can neither make nor retain one moment of time. It all comes to him by pure gift. He might as well regard it as, uh, as if the sun and the moon were his own. And later he says, um, and... The word mine, in its fully possessive sense, cannot be uttered by a human being about anything. In the long run, either our father or the enemy will say mine of each thing that exists, specifically of each man. They will find out in the end, never fear, to whom their time, their souls, and their bodies really belong. Certainly not to them, whatever happens. At present, the enemy says mine of everything on the pedantic, legalistic ground that he made it. Our father hopes in the end to say mine of all things on the more realistic and dynamic ground of conquest. So Satan um, hopes to say mine on the ground, more realistic and dynamic ground of conquest because he's trying to win us over by tempting us and bringing us down the path to hell um, and God God hopes to bring us closer to him and bring us into a relationship with him through his son. Yeah, to go off what your, your the unbeliever question, um, I think that an unbeliever would get the impression, I think just through C.S. Lewis's writing, that the, de the demons are not the best people because he, taught, he names them. Wormwood, Glubo, Slub Gob, Toad Pipe, Screw Tape, Scab Tree. Like, those are all some kind of gross, like, disgusting names. 
So I feel like that's one way that C.S. Lewis depicts them as um, kind of just deceitful and disgusting people. So um, I think like an unbeliever may be able to catch on to that little thing that he put in there. But yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Because uh, those are kind of disgusting names, so I wouldn't like hearing that as an unbeliever. It's um, it's not a particularly nice thing to think about. Um, so it's it depicts them as being gross and just not good. Um, Y'all got any more like major questions or anything? I think I'm good. So I would just say we talked about a lot, but like one main takeaway. What's like your main takeaway? Because I can definitely take away a lot of different aspects of knowledge from this book. What What's like the one thing that is probably most important for you personally? So the whole point is for demons to confuse you and tempt you. And I feel like this book has kind of opened my eyes to the ways they try to do it and the ways it happens in my life. So I feel like I can apply what I've learned from the book to my life because you see them confusing them and that can lead to bad decisions or just confusing them helps because it puts them in fear or anxiety and that helps them and I also remember there was this one part they were saying if God came up to him and told him hey I need you for today he would be like oh yes I will definitely come help you but what they don't realize is God is asking that of you every day and I don't think we realize that all the time we kind of just go about our day like any other day. And I think we need to have that mindset of there is an actual fight going on all the time. It is through our entire lives and it will keep going on and it will never stop. Well, I mean, actually it will stop when God eventually wins, but in our lifetime, I don't know if it will. And so we just have to be prepared for that, I think. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, I definitely agree with just that it gave me a better understanding of what's going on. Um, reminds me that there's a battle going on every day um, and that I need to close myself with the armor of God. I need to put on the armor of God and I've got Jesus on my side. So while the demons can tempt me, I have the power to overcome that um, through Jesus. And so because of the power he has given me, I can overcome that um, and seek him and go to him, ask him for help. Um, and so being able to overcome that and also just being aware of what I need to overcome um, and just listening to what the word says and instead of myself, the world, um, and demons. Yeah, I think for me, it may, it kind of helps me realize, or makes me realize that demons are not dumb. Like, demons are, and Satan, they're actually, they're smart. And the scary thing is that, um, we always know that God knows everything about us, but Satan and sin and demons, they know a lot about us also. And they know just as well, like they know how to attack us straightforward. And, and I think that's just something that made me kind of realize that sin is, I mean, it's really, it's gonna be really scary how, cause they know every little weakness we have everything that can be a distraction to us and just to see that sometimes like 
when you get distracted while praying sometimes or just like some bad thoughts you get it's just you realize that they know that you're susceptible there and they know how to attack it so now it's just being able to defend yourself against that so being like the shield of righteousness maybe to put out the flaming arrows of the devil yeah and i think we can do that by just being in the word yeah for sure yeah. well it's pretty good, good talking talk. yeah good talk guys cheers 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 Miss Lanclos, cheers. Cheers. Merry Christmas, Mrs. Lanclos. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.